So last we talked about oblique shocks, and this time we're going to be talking about expansion fans. And this is going to give us most of the tools we'll need to deal with real flows to actually get turned by something. In this case, a plane or a jet or whatever it is, it's going to be turned. So with an oblique shock, which we had before, it is a compressing flow. Okay, It compresses it because I have a flow that looks like this to begin with, and it runs into some boundary. It doesn't have to be the ground, it doesn't have to be a wall, it can be wing. And when that happens, that flow gets turned into itself. Because of that, these lines will get closer together. It has to compress. It's being pushed into itself. So in one side, I have it compressing. What we haven't talked about yet before is what happens if the flow gets turned away from itself. So I have the ground once again, but this time you can see that the ground is moving away from where the flow is going. So I have my flow going this way. And when it reaches that point, it is going to have to expand to be able to fill that gap. So what causes this expansion? Well, as a handy name, and makes really a lot of sense. It's called an expansion fan. Now, the idea of an expansion fan might surprise you what's going on here, why a fan. It's all about this shape. So let's go ahead and start defining it just a little bit here. So once again, I'm going to have that ground. But this time, I'm actually going to draw it with the expansion fan on it. So if I draw it like this, you'd be like, aha, it's just like a shock wave. However, the issue is it's not. It's actually over a finite region. So I have a forward Mach line right here. And I also have the rearward Mach line. And so both of those would have their own angles. So this one would have mu1. And this one right here would have mu2. Which every time I say that, it makes me smile because I'm thinking about Pokemon. Do not judge me. Come on. And we also have our deflection angle still, which is theta. So all of that is still there. However, while I showed you a front Mach line and a back Mach line, um, don't be confused there because, or don't be misled, there are an infinite number of Mach lines in between. So that's the big thing here. It's called a fan because there are an infinite number of Mach lines between the forward and the rearward Mach line. Now, this is a good thing. The reason it's a good thing is because I don't have a discontinuous line. So with an oblique shock, it is discontinuous. So I have a sudden change. Hello. With an expansion fan, it is a continuous change. And it's gradual. Now, since it's continuous and gradual, it is also isentropic. Which is nice for us because all of our isentropic relations work for an expansion fan while oblique shock waves are not isentropic. Now, what else will we see as we go through an expansion fan? Well, the first thing is thinking about it as it is expanding. And since it is expanding, okay, since it is expanding, we're going to see different things. So with an oblique shock, the temperature, pressure, density, all go up while the Mach number goes down. In an expansion fan, the temperature, the pressure, and the density all go down while my Mach number actually goes up. 
it does the exact reverse. So if you ever have to figure out what's going on with an expansion fan versus oblique shock, just think of it this way, okay? Expansion fans are kind of like reverse shock waves. Are they 100% actually that case? Uh, no, no, not 100% that way, but still. We can still get a lot from that. Okay, now how do we deal with expansion fans? Well, we deal with them through a very important function. And that is called the Prandtl-Meyer function. Now, as has been the case in the past, I am going to give you the equation. Um, I'm not going to go into the derivation for this because it's not super important for us. Um, it can be helpful, but it's just a very crazy equation. So what does the Prandtl-Meyer function look like? So I'll go ahead and give it to you, then we'll talk about it. So the problem our function here it is. It is a new, and it is a function of Mach number, and it equals the following. So it's a very long equation. Do I expect you to use this equation? Not at all. Why? Because there is a glorious table in the back of your textbook that has values for this, and you can interpolate if you want to. Or if you've got a nice little calculator, you can plug it in there, and then you don't have to interpolate. That is the only reason I would say to ever use the equation. You don't want to have to interpolate every time, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, well, you'll deal with it. There we go. So fairly long equation, and what is it doing? Well, it's connecting this function right here, the Pranomeyer function, to my Mach number. And then I have a second equation which I'm going to use, which is simply saying my deflection angle is equal to my Pranomeyer function after the expansion fan minus my Prandtl-Meyer function before the expansion fan. So going back to our drawing from earlier, I have some value for my Mach number M1 and afterwards I have some value for my Mach number M2. I want to know what those are. How do I figure it out? Well, you do it sort of like the following. So using M1, you would go and find out what your Prandtl-Meyer function is. You would then add theta to that Prandtl-Meyer function, and that would give you your second Prandtl-Meyer function, so Prandtl-Meyer function for afterwards. Then you can use that value to get your Mach number after the shock wave. The thing is, that's the only equation we really need to use for this. Because it is isentropic, we can use all of our isentropic relations to connect everything else. So we don't have too much there. Um, you can go to the isentropic properties tables and figure out all of your ratios from that. If you're trying to figure out, well, how do I figure out those ratios, it's actually really, really simple. So in your isentropic property tables, you will not ever see like P2 over P1 or T2 over T1. You don't see that. The only thing it gives you is it will give you T0 over T or P0 over P. It gives you the stagnation properties for these things. However, our, product, our expansion fan is isentropic. Since it's isentropic, that means that I can use these tables for both the flow before and after and the ratios as well. So if I want to find P2 over P1, all I need to realize is that that is simply equal to P2 over P0 over P1 over P0. And if I want T2 over T1, well, I know that that's going to be equal to T2 over T0 over T1 over T0. 
You're like, why no ones or twos right here? That is because P naught one is equal to P naught two and T naught one is equal to T naught two because this is isentropic. So, so long as I have the tables, I can find all the values I need for any particular problem. Now, while this is all well and good, we need to try out a problem or two because that's all you have to do. Like, that is it. We're, we're pretty much done. But I want to show this to you in several problems now so you can actually see it be used. Um, because now that we've gotten both oblique shocks down, which has a lot more going for it, and expansion fans, which are much simpler to deal with, we can deal with very complex flows now. We can deal with a lot of amazing shapes. So let's try that out.